Some of you know I can talk too long here before just diving in, so we're going to dive right in. Because it's November, I thought we would start with kind of connect the Battle of Antietam, I think appropriately, to Thanksgiving. Um, Thanksgiving is seemingly in my lifetime, the last 15 years, become somewhat maligned. I'm not so sure why, but um, Miss Sarah Josepha Hale would be sad to know that it become maligned. Um, through up to the Civil War, various presidents had offered moments of Thanksgiving, some intentionally, others at various times during the year, not consistently. Uh, Ms. Hale had been someone, though, who believed that it was really important for the, for the nation to have a moment of Thanksgiving and to make it significant. This feeling of hers had grown as the tensions leading into war had begun. So we're looking at what I think is the most important battle of the Civil War, which I hope to make that argument. Most people, of course, if you talk about the Civil War um, and you ask them significant battles, they go immediately to the sexy one, the one where we have the most money, the National Park has done the most work. I remember taking my daughters on, uh, and, and my wife, we did the proverbial East Coast trip with your children to see some of the sites and historical stuff and cool artistic things from here all the way up to, um, to New York or DC. And so we made sure, of course, my daughters laughingly tell that they talk to some of their friends now in college or post-college, and they're stunned to find out that their friends on vacation never went to a single museum and certainly <laughs> never went to a battlefield. So my daughters have figured out how weird I am that I made them go through that whole process. Some of you may be able to relate. But we went to Gettysburg, of course, and uh, it's lovely. This was before they did the update around, I think, 2010 or so, but you know they dumped uh, several million dollars into making it even better. And then we went to Antietam. And I remember pulling up the Antietam, and it was this, and I haven't been since, so maybe it's been improved, but it was this very small, there's plenty of seats down here in the front, there's plenty of seats, come on down, we'd love to have you. Um, it was a very small building, I mean, not, probably a ground floor, not bigger than this, and they had a museum, which, you know, most of these places have for our, battle, our various battlefields, and it was down in this little basement, dank, dark, and moldy. And you walked in, and if you've ever been in a basement, I grew up in Tennessee, so I have basements. You know what a moldy basement smells like. And I walked in, and I'm like, how sad is this? And so from that moment, it has been like my intention. I had two intentions. If I could ever become important and do something, one, I would make a ma major national monument for John Adams. And one, we would dump millions of dollars into Antietam because it is the most important battle. So I'm going to try to prove that point for you. Ms. Hale is talking to Lincoln, as she had been talking to several other presidents, saying, hey, this is important. We should, be, we should be doing something that is national, that is intentional, that kind of focuses. And she used her prowess as a literary person. She started a magazine. She, in her writing here, the Northwood, A Tale of New England, she had used this as a way to emphasize what the New Englanders had been doing since the time of the Pilgrims, of course. In April of 62 and earlier in 61, Lincoln had, following the predecessor of several of the other presidents, uh, issued an, uh, uh, an executive order saying, hey, there should be a proclamation day of Thanksgiving. Jefferson Davis had done the same thing down uh, in Richmond for the Confederate States of America. And everybody was fine with doing that, but it was a one-off. And so Ms. Hale, who had spent now, as you can see, most of her life trying to make this a national um, requirement um, pressed Lincoln one more time. Well, in 62, of course, is when Antietam's happening. So she's writing to him after he does the April proclamation, which then is before, and again, there's plenty of seats down here, so feel free to come on down. I don't bite, I promise. Um, before the Battle of, of Antietam. Um, and so he thinks about it, and then ultimately, he will ask his Secretary of State, William Seward, to write up that very proclamation. Now, if you know your Thanksgiving history, which we're not going to get too deep into, this is really the last slide of it, you know that there's several more moments Grant will issue some. If you go and you Google, like, when was it, like, official, you'll get, like, four different dates. Um, certainly, there was the moment in um, World War II when kind of both houses of Congress forcing FDR's hand made it law that it would be the fourth Thursday. They went with last, and they said, wait, we have th November's with five, let's go to the fourth. Um, but there are several moments before that in which different presidents had kind of pushed this in. But I do think it's important for us to understand that Ms. Hale is really the driving force. She's really the one who's kind of pushing this agenda 
saying it's important. Why then in 63 would Lincoln really want to go down this road? Well, certainly Hale is the part of the reason, but part of it is, as hopefully you know already, the war and the cause and the focus, really more focus than cause, has changed. And it's changed because of a change that occurs within Lincoln. So what I want to do today is I want us to spend time, first of all, let me see if I can prove my case, because there may be some historians in here or some uh, Civil War buffs in here who are like, no, 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 Gettysburg is most important. But I want to try to demonstrate to you that Gettysburg is really an afterthought. Um, it's, it's sexy, we like it, it's the big three-day battle, but it was insignificant in the general strategic fight of the war. So I'll kind of prove that point to you, but then I'm also going to try to hopefully point out to you that um, we may have a misunderstanding of Lincoln, and we need to kind of be honest with that, take a look at that and see what happens. So let's backtrack a little bit and see kind of how we got here. Well, we don't have time to do the road to the Civil War. We've done that before at the library. Maybe we'll do that again in our future, although it's a very difficult talk to do in an hour and a half. But as you know, all the tensions between the sides over a variety of issues of which at the center of is slavery. Um, drives the two parts of the country into a sectional vision. And a variety of things happen really from the beginning of the country through 1860 that continuously pushed both sides to where they felt deeply aggrieved. And, and while we are obviously watching two, although there's more than two, um, global conflicts right now that are tragic and sad, I think if we're fair, we could argue that all the combatants in these two global conflicts would tell you that they are aggrieved and they have a reason for their animosity and for therefore their actions. Well, this then raises questions for anyone trying to mediate said issue for these people because we end up having to maybe take a side. Both the North and the South, certainly by the 1844 election, had felt frustrated. When Lincoln is elected, he's elected as a member of the third abolition party, the Republicans. The Republicans were an abolition party, having followed in the footsteps of the Liberty Party and then the, the Free Soil Party in 1854-55, coming out of Bleeding Kansas, they kind of went forward and created a new title. And so you end up with this moment that the war starts because of his election. The fighting, of course, starts with the Battle of Bull Run. And for those of you who know your Civil War history, I'm pretty much going to stick with the, the northern titles. If you know your Civil War history, you know for most of our battles, or many of them, you have two names. So I've been to Manassas. It is a wonderful place to go. It's a wonderful, fun battlefield. The battlefield of Manassas has a better visitor center than the battlefield of Antietam. That's tragic. <laughs> Lincoln's got a problem, though. He can't find a general, as he says, that who can do the arithmetic. What's he mean by that? Well, eminent Civil War historian Shelby Foote says it this way. The, the Civil War was fought by the North with one hand tied behind its back, meaning at no point does the Civil War ever go to what we would call a total war footing in which the totality of the society is now engaged in struggle. At no point for the North does this become, as we might say, existential, in which everybody's involved in this conflict. And so Shelby Foote's point is that a key back to Lincoln's quote here is that the North's just gonna win on sheer attrition if, as Lincoln is pointing out, I can find a general who's willing to do the arithmetic, meaning it's okay for us to lose four to one or five to one, which in a military setting is a terrible outcome for you, but we can do it if we have to because they'll run out of people before we will. But I gotta find a general who's got the backbone to go in that and take not only the scathing psychological trauma of watching your soldiers die at a high rate, but then face the heat from a free press. Um, and we will allow the free press to operate in the country throughout the Civil War, and both Davis and Lincoln and all the key generals, Lee, Grant, they will be just skewered right and left by the press for various things that the press finds wrong in their presentation. McClellan will become the person in charge after what could be a debacle. I don't think it's a debacle, but the defeat of Bull Run. McClellan's one of the most polarizing figures of the Civil War. I always feel a little sympathy for McClellan because at one point he is a very good general. He would have been an amazing quartermaster. He'd have been the person who was responsible for feeding, clothing, even training his, his soldiers. But he was terrible on the battlefield. 
He was someone that I kind of likened to a person who might have uh, owned a very fancy car or a very fancy old car that they only wanted to bring out for shows, but they never ever wanted to drive it any other time, which of course would make sense if it was a fancy car that was for shows, but then you got to have something you drive. If you never drive and you're walking everywhere, you've kind of missed the point of having an automobile. And as a general, unfortunately, your job in war is to take your army out into harm's way and people will die. And McClellan just could never get past that point. So back to Lincoln's quote, he simply was somebody who was unwilling to face that. Now, we might think that is a good thing for McClellan, and there were people who did, and people who, as you know, if you know the rest of your Civil War history, who thought of somebody like Grant as a butcher. Um, but that's a whole different conversation for our talk today. McClellan takes over, and he feels very good about himself in taking over after Bull Run. And so his position was, we need to retrain. And he was right. You remember our history as a nation is that we don't like um, a standing army. We, we're happy with the military, per se, and we're happy to have places like West Point where we, are, we will train leaders, but kind of the whole point to some degree of the Second Amendment is we will never have a standing army. And of course, why is because we know standing armies are used by governments against their own people. Historically, that's kind of the point. So we don't want to ever give our government power. You have to remember, this is not the civics part, but I'll just throw this in. When you look at our government and the structure of our Constitution, it was written by people who were sitting in a room saying, I don't trust any of y'all, and none of you should trust me. So we got to now construct a system in which, because there will be power in a, in a central government, but we have to construct a system in which nobody can get all the power. And they thought of various ways to do it. And so one way was you never let the government have any money because money gives the power. And you never let the government have a standing military. So when war breaks out, and you'll see this multiple times in our national history, including World War II, um, we don't have an army ready to go. So we have to spend time getting ready, preparing it, training it. And you know that any um, inefficiency shows up at Bull Run for both sides, although the South had spent the previous year and a half really training their state militias so that they were more prepared, not by much, but a little bit. McClellan's out there. The Civil War is also a lot of fun if you like um, spy stuff, James Bond and that kind of thing and finding things out. And McClellan and, Bo and Jefferson Davis and Lincoln, they've got a whole spy network happening. Unfortunately for McClellan, his spy network was almost always wrong. And so one of the things McClellan began to believe was that the Confederacy had somewhere between 100 and maybe as many as 300,000 forces in Northern Virginia threatening the capital. Remember, D.C.'s in the south to its north and west or east is Maryland, which was a slaveholding state, which we'll come back to Maryland a little bit later in our talk, and then, of course, Virginia. So it's, it's right there. And while had Lincoln chosen to abandon the capital, it wouldn't have strategically necessarily been the end of the Union's fight. It metaphorically and psychologically was a really big deal. And so, you know, he wants to keep it. So McClellan's determined to defend it, but he knows he's got he's to fight. McClellan's aware that you can look at warfare much as a math experiment, you know, both in the tactical aspect that we're about to fight a battle. How many do we have and how many do they have? And then where are some of the defensive aspects? Are they in the mountains? Are they behind rivers? Do you have better technology? These are all pieces that get kind of put into that equation. But it's a math experiment that usually cannot be counterbalanced even through sheer bravery. If you have three to one odds, you should win. And so McClellan is able to build up enough forces, but because he believes the Confederacy has massive amounts of forces, he doesn't want to do that. So his idea is, I want to try to copy Napoleon, who he was often compared to, mostly in his own mind, um, <laughs> that um, I'll just do it end around. Now, this is not an unwise or un, uh, you know, poorly executed. It's actually very well executed by McClellan, though there's a few hicks pickups along the way, but you can see he wanted to move his troops, go down to where Yorktown was, and advance on Richmond from below. Okay, great. The biggest problem is it's not necessary. You, you, at this point, he probably had between 175 and 225,000 troops under his direct command near D.C., and the Confederate Army was never more than 50,000, which again, you can do the math on that, so it's at least three to one, if not four to one odds, and while it would have been bloody, you can win that battle fairly easily. Um, but he doesn't believe that, so he wants to go around. And so he sets out to do this, and he does. The only problem is, it's McClellan. 
And so as someone who was out driving their fancy car, they might go 10 miles an hour. Winter Park's famous for its 20 mile an hour speed limits. You can imagine me behind somebody who's going even slower at 10 miles an hour, very cautiously. He successfully lands here. Here's Yorktown. He lands here on the end, and he had roughly 50,000 troops when he landed, and he was facing basically no one. Now between Richmond and here, this is, this is roughly 40 to 50 miles. Now, you know, some of you are in better shape than I, but we could collectively, this group, we could basically walk that in five days, resting, you know, maybe a few of you might need to slow down at some point and fall out and be there on the sixth and seventh day. And some of you maybe, well, you runners could do it maybe in a day, um, but we could be in Richmond, meaning the Confederate army, go back to this map, is way up here. And you forget these lines, you're way up here, all the red's up here. And so all McClellan has to do is actually technically start his army going this way. Now there were some Confederate troops here in this area, roughly 10,000, but he of course waited almost an entire month to get his full army of 120,000. So he could have already sent the advance forces on and when those 50,000 confronted the 10,000, five to one odds, they're behind defensive positions, so you kind of bring that down to maybe two and a half to one odds. You still win that, you just roll over them and move on. McClellan doesn't go. In fact, Warwick was so good, I mean, at the Warwick River, the forces that were there, they know each other. Of course, you know this from the Confederacy and the Civil War story, that most of these generals are all fr friends to some degree, or at least acquaintances. So the guy who's in charge of the 10,000 knows McClellan. And in one of my favorite stories about McClellan, what he did was he split his group up into like three groups of roughly 3,000 people, took them about a mile out of town, had them get as much brush and kind of uh, uh, organic materials as possible and to begin marching into town as loudly as possible dragging the brush they spread their 3,000 out so that from afar what you saw was this big cloud of smoke <laughs> indicating an army marching and the 3,000 would come marching in and as soon as they got to town they would sneak off to the side and they'd go all the way back here for a whole other turn and they did this for hours the same two forces <laughs> just in circles McClellan sends a, a note to, to Lincoln. It's like, I can't go any further. I need another 50,000 troops because the whole army is here, which, of course, it was not. When he eventually attacked, actually, he didn't even have to attack much because the forces finally pulled back when Johnson, who's the commander for the Confederacy, gets to Richmond. So the whole opportunity that could have been, had Napoleon been there, Richmond would have been captured on, like, day two because there was nobody there really to defend Richmond from those initial 50,000. The point of that is this gives us the coming of Robert E. Lee. A lot of people are surprised when they say the Civil War and like, wait, Robert E. Lee's not in charge? Nope, Robert E. Lee's on the bench. He's on the bench largely because he had fought some initial campaigns in the western part of Virginia, back to that free press, he got blistered in the press because it didn't go as well as they had thought it should go. I always tell my students it'd be like having you know, one of the best athletes, you know, like in basketball, having LeBron James and in a, in a preseason game, he dribbles the ball off his foot. So when the season starts, you put him on the bench. God, I can't trust that guy. He dribbles off his foot. Like, it's a preseason game. It doesn't really matter. Lee is clearly the best general in the entire nation. That's why the Union offered him command of the, of the full army. He turns it down in deference to supporting Virginia. So in this process, Lee's not even fighting. But the guy who was in charge, Johnson, gets wounded. And finally, at some point, McClellan finally decides, well, actually, McClellan doesn't really attack. He just kind of sits outside Richmond. Johnson attacks him. Johnson gets wounded. Lee takes over. Actually, in the press that day in the South, he, again, John, um, President Davis gets kind of blistered, like, oh my gosh, you've ruined us. We're doomed. You're putting Lee in charge. Lee, of course, brilliant as he was, knew immediately what he needed to do, and he began a series of attacks that are known as the Seven Days Battles. And this again gives you some insight of it's McClellan. Five battles are fought over seven days. Now, when you talk about winning and losing battles, I know this always frustrates a lot of people, but you're really talking about who, who lost the most people and or who stayed on the ground or who retreated off the ground. But if you just look at sheer like losses of humans, which I know we don't want to think about, but that's sort of what you have to do in military terms. The Union Army won four of the five days. And yet on seven of the seven days, McClellan retreated all the way away from Richmond to where he was down here on the James River where he could be protected by the Union Navy. So again, there's your picture of, of McClellan. He sits there, he pouts. 
And Lee now has to make a decision. Now that I am in charge, what will I do? And Lee begins to think in terms of the fact that he needs to find a way to kind of put the award on terms that he wants. So he begins thinking about how can I make a change here? And his change is that he needs to go from defense to offense. He also understood the math that Lincoln was talking about. And he said, if we completely stay here and think we can just wait for the union to give up, we will always be on the losing end of them counterattacking. Because Lee had already successfully gotten the measure of Lincoln, and he understood that as long as Lincoln was the president, um, he would be confronted with a, a continued offense from the Union armies. And eventually this could be detrimental to the overall health of the soldiers. They would run out of soldiers, is Lee's, Lee's position. Lincoln, again, grasping for straws, puts this man in charge, John Pope, and he's told to basically prepare. And again, this shows you the depth. Pope, even though McClellan is down in Virginia with now an army of roughly 100,000 troops, and some of those troops will be moved immediately back to D.C., the Union Army is able to roll out an army of a roughly 60 to 70,000 troops in to defend D.C., meaning, again, the numbers are on the north side in this whole equation. So what is Lee going to do? Lee needs to figure out a way to do two things. One, he wants to try to expand who's in the Confederacy. And as I already mentioned to you, Maryland is not in the Confederacy. The reason not is because when Marylanders tried to rise up and vote, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus and arrested most of the leaders and put them in prison and left them there. And then once he did that, there was this sense of, okay, go ahead and vote if you want to. And Marylanders voted by a very narrow margin to stay in the Union or not secede. But again, this is because Lincoln basically denied people their First Amendment rights. So in that process, Lee believes, and there was some reason to think maybe that he was right, or that he had good intel, that Marylanders themselves would rise up and either fully secede from the Union, thus surrounding the Capitol, or thousands of young Marylanders would join the cause lots of supplies would be involved. Now, we're not yet at the Confederacy where you sometimes think of them as we think about the guys who were at Valley Forge, you know, walking around in ratter, ratty uniforms and no shoes. The Confederacy is fairly well off. I mean, they're not superbly well off, but they're not, again, walking around barefoot as we sometimes think about the Confederacy. That'll be true in 64 and 65 to some degree. But Lee still knows more supplies will be good for us. But by bringing Maryland in, the key thing is it brings pressure onto Lincoln there in D.C. Now, by this point, D.C. is a fortress. So it would have been very, very difficult. If you know anything about siege warfare relative to warfare in general, it's very difficult to do. The reason Hannibal spent 10 years wandering around Italy instead of taking Rome is he never had the capacity for siege warfare, which you needed to have to take out Rome. So again, it would have been very difficult even in 62, but possibly. But what he's also thinking about, what Lee wants to do is go all the way up into Virginia. So here's the map of what they did do, but he wants to get all the way up here into Virginia. Here's Gettysburg, right? And then over here is York. And then on the river over here is where Harrisburg is. And if you could kind of dive up here and take Harrisburg, then this puts a pressure on Philadelphia. He doesn't need to take Philadelphia. He just wants to put pressure on Philadelphia. What's he trying to do? Well, the key thing he's trying to do besides Maryland is he's trying to get support from Great Britain. After the Seven Days Battle, um, both France and Great Britain are having open discussions to say, we need to recognize the South. Now, this is important to understand, or at least that you understand, what does it mean when you say you recognize someone? So just think in terms of our own journey in the American Revolution. What did we spend the first year and a half trying to do? Get France on our side in our battle with our civil war, but our battle with England at the time, right? Well, why would France not want to do that? Well, they just spent the last hundred years fighting a series of wars with, with England, losing most of them. So if they're going to stick their neck out to help, they kind of needed to know that it was going to be legitimate. And the way you stick your neck out to help is to say, I recognize you as a nation. So right now, Kosovo over in the Balkans is still kind of waiting for a lot of places to, be, to recognize them. Um, Catalan on the Iberian Peninsula, part of Spain, is still wanting to really be independent, although Spain won't recognize that. And of course, nobody in the EU will recognize that because if we recognize Catalan as an independent nation, maybe Brittany will want to leave France. And so we just don't want to get into that kind of thing. 
I tell my students, imagine Florida, not that I want this, but imagine Florida did decide to secede from the Union. Well, who would we need help from? Well, we'd want help from Russia or China, mostly China. And China would have to think, is it worth our effort to stick our nose out to help Florida in this secession effort for early 21st century? Because it will involve war. But if we recognize Florida and don't help them, then we're really going to be in trouble. So the idea of recognition is a really big step for the other country. You're really stepping into it. Remember, at this point, England and Great Britain, they're not our friends. They don't like us. We don't like them. And we have huge Canada lust. We want Canada. We still perceive it as part of our manifest destiny story. We'll give them the eastern part where Montreal and Toronto is, but that's it. We want all the rest of it. The Northerners were still mad in the 1844 election that James Polk, when he was elected, failed to deliver on his promise of 5440 or bust, which was the promise that we would take all of the Oregon Territory, which is basically from Sacramento up to Alaska. Then, of course, Polk's like, yeah, we don't need to get in that. We don't need to fight a war with England. And so we don't like England. But the last thing Lincoln needs is a war on two fronts. So he's aware, Lincoln, that I've got a problem potentially with Great Britain joining in. And as you can see from these comments, both Great Britain and France are thinking Napoleon III, of course, is the, the emperor. Of course, is France is trying to figure herself out. They now have an emperor again. And he won't do it without England because he's aware that Great Britain is a superpower. And so he is basically using his diplomatic efforts to push Great Britain. Now, now why would they do this? Think in terms of, of British foreign policy, right, or French foreign policy. A split and divided Northern American continent is better for them geopolitically, right? So a united over the entire continent, and it already had been a fear once we won the war that half the continent was ours, and then from British point of view, France foolishly gave us Louisiana, and now it's even bigger, which led to the tension over Oregon. And then we fought our war with the Mexicans, and we took this, the lower half. So from a British geopolitical point of view, because they're the world superpower, the last thing they wanted was a United States over the total continent. So if they could split that up in some way, that's to their benefit. So they're thinking about it as they go. So Lee's got a plan, and his plan is really simple. He's going to basically march from here and head north. He wants to get to Hagerstown and maybe get to Gettysburg. He has no, idea, no desire to fight there, but to go north, as I already told you. Then he believes the Union Army would have to follow him, and he could fight on a battlefield of his choosing. And from Lee's point of view, once I fight and win a battle in the north, that will be the moment that England will recognize us. In other words, Lee is looking for his own Battle of Saratoga. Because as you should remember from your American Revolutionary days, it's the Battle of Saratoga that convinces the French to help us. We won a significant battle, so now France goes, okay, I'll stick our neck out and we'll help you. So they recognize us, they sign the alliance with Ben Franklin. Lee needs that same moment. So that's what he's going for here in the process. So along the way, he fights and quickly d dispatches Pope's forces, who were not who were no match for the for the for this Confederate army, and they've been making their way north. On September 4th, they cross the Potomac. Then he realizes that he thought all the forts in that region were evacuated. Um, they, because of Lee, Lincoln trying to find enough troops to build an army, they weren't. So he's got to deal with that. So he um, comprises an order that is known as Order 191, in which he would send <laughs> his forces in four directions to go and take these forts. Is that my phone? No, it's me. I'm sorry. Okay, no, it's fine. I thought I'd probably turn my phone off. Um, he, to get these forts. This becomes the turning moment of this entire war. Now, Lincoln, because of Pope's defeat, has had to turn back to McClellan to put McClellan in charge. McClellan writes his wife, like, I am the returning hero. It's my, my moment, my day. I'm going to be, going to take, it's going to be great for me. Order 191 gets lost. And this becomes the very famous lost orders that leads to the Battle of Antietam. In other words, remind yourself that Lincoln, I'm sorry, Lee has no idea or no plans to fight in Maryland. His point to march into Maryland is to rouse the kind of patriotic spirit for the early 1776, because remember the Confederacy's 
in their mind, they are the patriots like we were in 1776. That's their, that's their justification. That's their kind of psychological positioning. We're the, we're the good guys. We're the patriots. So he wants the Marylanders to join them. And he just wants to march through, pick up as many people as possible, and then eventually go on north as we've already talked about. What happens is because Lincoln and the Union Army is aware that Lee's on the move, various forces of the Union Army are shadowing the Confederacy as they go north. They're, they're kind of with them, at least small groups are. And so a group of soldiers from Indiana stumbled into a camp that had been evacuated the day before, and they found a few things lying around, and one of the things they found lying around was a knapsack, kind of a small bag like you might imagine somebody carrying. And of course, three privates found it, and so they want to see what's in there, and there's some cigars, there's some little bit of food, there's some stuff that they're wrestling with. Around the cigars is wrapped some paper. So they're like throwing that off, I don't need to see that. They might not even been able to read. Their corporal who was with them, though, goes, what is that? Because he saw that it had some writing on it, like, I don't know. And he let them divide up the cigars and the food, and he takes it and opens it and recognizes after a few minutes, this is Lee's battle plan. He's like, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so he immediately races this to McClellan's headquarters. So here's your setting. Lee's army is split into four parts, divided across Maryland before they make the move to Pennsylvania. And McClellan, who perceives himself a Napoleonic hero before Napoleon becomes an emperor, although there's some hints that McClellan was thinking in, the, in that kind of, I could be an emperor. Um, in fact, he and Lincoln have an exchange about that, and Lincoln says, I'll risk it if you can just win. I'll worry about that part later. Um, McClellan's like, I've got it. I can make this happen. I'm so excited. But see, Lee's not worried. Even before he, and see, Lee never knows the, the orders are lost. So it'll be late in his life that he finds out that, oh, they had your battle orders, because he doesn't know it. And so when McClellan's put back in charge, Lee's like, we're okay. I mean, you probably already read it, but I mean, McClellan is an able general, but he's cautious. His army's very demoralized, will not be prepared for offensive operation, or he will not think it so. I mean, again, McClellan, I, I get my car ready. I've got I've to shine it maybe three or four times, three or four days in a row. I've got to really make it good and clean, even though it was clean on day one, ready to go. McClellan's like, I can make this move. I can be the hero in this story. But of course... He didn't. Instead, he sat and wait. And he didn't move some troops forward, but his moving forward was cautious and slow. Now, on September the 14th, his advanced elements will stumble into where Lee's army is. So here, here's Harper's Ferry, and this is basically part of the Appalachian Mountains in this area of Maryland. Little, they're not high mountains, but this is this kind of area here. And he stumbles into this area. When those forces show up, Lee recognizes something's happened. And he doesn't know what's happened. And again, he doesn't never find out about the orders being lost. But he's aware that something has changed in the tactical, strategic arena. So he sends word out to his forces, maybe we shouldn't go to Pennsylvania yet until we know what's going on. Because he was up in Hagerstown, which is up here, which is already uh, basically, this is lower uh, Pennsylvania. And so he sends word and says, hey, we'll go back down to Sharpsburg, which is here, because it's more central for everyone. So we'll kind of meet in Sharpsburg and see if we can figure out what's happening. He can't believe that McClellan's just moving on his own, and yet he's got these battles. He finds out Jackson is successful here, taking, uh, taking out the garrison at Harper's Ferry. So he's like, okay, fine. So if McClellan, because he's already here, right, and his armies are right behind here in this area, if he would just go ahead and move in, Initially, he will, will crush whatever is at Sharpsburg, but it's McClellan, so he doesn't. So this kind of gets us to the actual Battle of Antietam, where we are in the process. On the early evening of the 16th, McClellan's forces began arriving, getting in the outside of the city. Here's the very famous Sharpsburg um, uh, Antietam Creek right here. And so here's where the forces are in the small city of Sharpsburg. There's a kind of wheat fields and agricultural stuff up here, and then this, this creek, and it is a creek, um, become very important in the story. McClellan will move some of his initial forces north across the river to be north of Sharpsburg. 
He doesn't do this well. His forces don't do this well. And all this does is alert Lee that he's here. So now it's a scramble for who can get their forces ready. Yet again, if McClellan would simply attack, it's really a foregone conclusion at this point. Lee's missing forces, they're still kind of scattered. He's got most of his forces, somewhere around 40,000. McClellan is going to be there with 80,000. So again, from the math point of view, two to one odds. If you're playing this as a video game and you're the Union, you just attack. You just attack immediately. But, but it's McClellan, so he doesn't. Let me show you a closer map here. Kind of brings it a little closer, a little arbitrary, I don't know how to show it. But what McClellan's plan was, was not a bad plan. It's a plan to attack all at once across the line, kind of north, not really here necessarily, but sort of central, putting pressure, and then definitely from the south. Definitely a north and south attack. Now, what Lee has, from a military point of view, is what is called interior lines, meaning he has the ability to move his people more quickly than the other side does because they have to go further around. It's kind of obvious, which you can see from the map here. And he's going to have to do that, obviously, because he doesn't have as many forces. If McClellan would just attack all at once, then it's really not going to be that big of a battle, actually. I mean, Lee would, would really have to just get out because he's not going to be able to successfully hold off two to one odds in most cases. Fortunately for Lee, he's, placed, he's facing against McClellan. Here's another map. Now, this turns it sideways, so just so you get your reference. This is the way we normally look at it, north to south, but I do like this map, this map here, whoops, because it does give us a little more clarity. So the Union has come from this direction, they're all over here, here's the two sides, here's the lower side, here's the upper side, here's where he's moved troops over to this area to try to attack from the north, and then because he moved those troops, Lee's alerted. So he's able to move nearly all of his forces to confront. So he, at this part of the attack, it would not be two to one odds because Lee has moved most of his forces to confront part of McClellan's forces. Again, in McClellan's defense, which we'll come back to this in a second, he is thinking he'll make an attack at the same time. The problem for McClellan is he never actually told his own commanders this was the plan. <laughs> so he never really was able to coordinate. In fact, the southern attack, which is not on this map, I'll go back. The southern attack down here, which we'll get, is led by a man named Burnside. Some of you already know where we're going with this. And down here with Burnside, and he understood he was supposed to attack sometime in the morning. This attack will start around 5.30 a.m. You would think when you hear that, you'd say, oh, it must be starting now. But McClellan had told him not to go without his orders. So, okay, maybe I should wait. So he doesn't even really begin to do anything till 10, five, four and a half hours after the whole thing began. So in the morning, uh, Hooker, who we'll come back to when you get to Gettysburg, and then later, his first corps will begin the attack through the, what's known as the Wheatfield area, basically attacking down into to the city. It is initially a success, but it'll be just a slamming back and forth of troops in a, just a murderous fistfight, a murderous gun battle back and forth. Jackson's there, Stonewall Jackson. They'll basically hold out for a while. And eventually, Hooker will request support from up here, his backup, coming from Manfield's 12th Corps. This is where you, they're fighting. If you ever get to go there, this is the, the Wheatfield area. Manfield will come down this road, but most of his troops were raw recruits. They're also marching in formation as opposed to marching in line or marching in a kind of battle-ready position. Again, some of that's due to the raw recruit aspect, that they're not sure they could put them into a battle formation and then march forward collectively successfully. Well, this, of course, made them ready targets for the Confederate artillery, who did basically blast them. So by the time you get to 9 a.m., now word goes back to McClellan, we need more reinforcements. Now remember, McClellan's plan is to be attacking on all sides. He doesn't want to give up his reinforcements. So he reluctantly does so by sending in John Sedgwick, who's part of Sumner's Second Corps. So that's these guys coming here. So they're kind of heading this direction. So they will, they'll make that way in, but the battle over there by the wheat field is so bloody and so convoluted that then Sedgwick sends out word, we need reinforcements. And he'll be reinforced by another group from his, from his corps and may, uh, under the lead of William French. And we'll back to this map, it's a little bit easier to see. Go back, where am I at? Sorry, this is, come on, there we go. 
So they need to be going this way. Now, if you've ever studied World War I history, and you've ever looked at the Schlieffen plan with World War I and the Germans, you know their plan was to make a very large swing north through, through Belgium and the Netherlands, basically near the English Channel, and then sweep down behind the Seine River and envelop Paris all at once within the early stages of the war. When they met up with French and British troops in World War I in 1914, they engaged in battle. Now, I'm not a veteran, but I understand from having studied and read several reports, once the heat of battle begins, it's very difficult to ask soldiers to either pull out of an attack and go back on the required directions of moving, and it becomes really simple sometimes for these and almost like a, like a, a tangled mess of humans to just go in whatever direction the mass goes. So if you know your story around the Schlieffen plan in the early days of World War I, the Germans will cut short their, 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 their turn so that they never cross the Seine River north of Paris. They're underneath it. And the why, you say, it's because they get into the field of battle. In other words, it's easy for you and I to look at a map and say, well, just go here. But in the heat of battle, with things exploding around you and being in combat, it's easy to get lost. French's troops get lost. And as they are trying to come over this direction to help confront the battle that's still raging at this point, they actually make a turn and come down south. They were supposed to go here, and instead they come this direction and turn south. What they stumble into will become the center of the battlefield, and the battle will shift to the center in what becomes is a sunken road. So this is the sunken road. Now this is from years and years of farming in which you would drive your wagons and your cattle and your livestock on certain parts of your field and the other parts you wouldn't. And so this is pictures that I've taken on there. You can see my little daughter right there. I had my older daughter stand on this so you could get a perspective. I'm standing in the bottom of the sunken road. So you could tell if she was coming towards me, all she would see is my head. And if I'm laying down, barely that. But her whole body would be exposed to me if I was trying to shoot at her. So you can see how this is going to go for the Union. French is not going where he thinks he's going. He's not even going into prepared battle. He's just kind of marching along, and they made a turn they didn't realize that they turned into, and they end up going straight towards the sunken road where the Confederates are waiting. Now, they're not waiting for French. They're just kind of there, but they realize, here comes a regiment. We need to take care of these guys. So they begin the process of battling. And this goes for a long distance. You can see it goes all the way down here through this area. So it's a fairly long expanse. French's troops will get into this battle, and of course, they then will find themselves overwhelmed, cut down in a bloody mess. They will ask for reinforcements. At the same time, Lee will be rushing up reinforcements. The battle then to the north has basically died out at this point, and it has shifted to the center. There are still forces of both the Confederacy and the Union who are fighting up in that area, but in general, it's been so bad since 5.30 that basically those who are there are content to just rest and stay out of it. It's so messy, but it shifts to the center. Now, the Confederates don't have as much of an ability to rest because, again, they're outnumbered. But again, Lee, interior lines, is able to shift troops over, He'll shift Anderson in and bring him into this attack. And they will hold the line for about another hour until finally, I'll come back to this map, the north is able to cross up here at the top. And that little post right there and that little monument right there is roughly where the, the northern troops finally were able to push through the defenses of the Confederacy and get on the line so they could begin shooting down. So it becomes the sunken lane becomes known as the bloody lane. And the crossfire was so brutal, reports are that at some spots in the lane, up to 10 inches of blood was pooling up in certain spots, just showing you the sheer enormity of the death total that was occurring. There were some Confederate soldiers who were wounded who drowned before they died, their faces in blood and they couldn't turn over the masses on top of them. It was a gruesome experience. So again, you're thinking, okay, McClellan's held out in the north, and even though this somewhat of a mistake by French has now turned in favor of the, of the Union, all he needs to do is press the attack. 
Yes, it is all he needs to do is press the attack again. Here we are by 130 over 5,600 men late dead, right just in this little area right here. But it's McClellan. So you know, what? come on, it doesn't want to turn for me. He doesn't want to do it. He has approximately 26,000 soldiers who have not committed to the battle. And the forces that were there, like Richardson and French, are sending word to McClellan, commit your forces, bring in the reinforcements. We've broken through. We can push on into the city. McClellan refuses to do it. He continues to sit and wait and wait and wait. Lee now realizes he's got to make sure he protects his only exit out of town. You may have seen on one of the slides earlier, before he heard about Stonewall Jackson's success at Harper's Ferry, he did consider, should we retreat? Somehow McClellan has found me. He shouldn't have, but he has. Is this gonna work out for us? Remember what Lee's point was, and, he'll, and this time it's not his fault. A year from now, it will be his fault. In both the 62 and 63 Northern Vance, Lee's looking to find a battlefield of his choosing in which to fight and inflict as much damage in, in his mind when, obviously. This battlefield is not his choosing. So he's considering, do I get out? He didn't, which has been where we've been. But now, as the day has gone by, he knows McClellan has more troops. He is aware that he's got some troops, but it's a very small number of troops that are kind of in the vicinity and moving their way to Sharpsburg. So it's like, can I, can I wait? And if he loses the southern angle below the city, it's quite possible that he'd get trapped by McClellan's much larger army. So even though he's got the pause because McClellan has not pressed the attack as he should have, he still knows that there are significant Union forces to his south separated only by a small creek. And so he's like, I need to make a move on this. So he begins moving what forces he could without totally eliminating the line down to the south. So this takes us down here to Burnside's Bridge, which is not named in honor of Burnside. So this is where it is. This is the bridge itself. As you can see, if you look really close on the bridge, you can see the water level does rise and fall. That's about three feet right there. It's currently at this stage at about a foot, foot and a half when I was there. So at high levels, it could be maybe at three feet, maybe three and a half feet, still up to your waist, maybe, right? Um, you could kind of get through that if you wanted to. Um, at the time of this battle, according to first person accounts, it was little 18 inches, maybe, maybe thigh high in some spots, right? So you and I know what to do here, right? You're attacking from the south. Does anybody have a question about what they're supposed to do? You just send everybody across, right? Particularly now that you know, now Burnside doesn't necessarily know this, but you know, you're playing the video game, Lee's forces are to the north of the city and they're completely outnumbered and very few people are guarding this place. That'd be what you would do. So even though McClellan gets a lot of derision from this battle, we have to get some of it to Burnside. And then we have to wonder about Lincoln when he puts Burnside in charge later in the year. But that's a different story. Okay? So, again, in Burnside's defense, as I told you, he was, quote, unquote, waiting on orders. He finally gets the orders around 10, so roughly four and a half hours after the battle. So trust me, he could have heard the battle was going on, but he didn't do anything about it. When he finally begins to make his move, there are about 500 troops above the bridge right here. So I'll come back to this. This is what it looks like. This is where they were. Now, from Burnside's point of view, you and I can see the problem, right? They've got an elevated spot. So remember in military, and I've told you this already, it's a, it's a math equation. When you put elevation on the defensive side, or you put behind a river, or up in the mountains, or behind prepared defenses, or in a sunken road, you have to change the math equation in favor of the smaller number. So it is true that Burnside is now facing elevated forces who have the angle on him, who, as you can see, this is spring when I'm here, so it's a little later, it's closer to fall when they're there, but still, you can see, they would have had a clear shot on the bridge and on the creek, right? So you wouldn't have gotten across unscathed. But again, you're talking your 10,000 versus their 500. They can't shoot that fast. 
Nobody's got repeating rifles at this point. So you've got the opportunity if you wish to make it. So he's got his um, 10,000 people coming across, or 12,500. Now back here, there's another 3,000, which is kind of like Lee's last reserves. But again, from a math point of view, you've got four to one odds if you're Burnside. So just run across the bridge, run across the water, send everybody across. What he does though is he splits his forces, which is not wise to do. Um, and what he did is he sent some of his troops down south where he thought that there was a ford that they could get across. Well, those guys get down south and find out that the, the, the edges of the creek are too steep. So they go, instead of going back where they should have been at the first place, they march another two miles south to what they believe is another ford. It will be there. They will eventually cross the river. But you basically, if you're Burnside, taken a segment of your four to one odds, and now you've made it three to one odds because you've just given that away, moving them down south for no good reason. Again, you're not facing equal forces that you can't overwhelm or that you need to somehow flank. You know, if they've been there with 5,000 troops to your 12,000, okay, maybe you need to try to find a way to flank them. That's not the setting and where it is. Now, again, back to this picture, you can see, and if you stand on it, some of you may have been there like I have, you, you, there's only really room for like six or eight people, and many of us have been at places like going into a, a sporting event where they put us in confined spaces, or you've been in the queue at Disney or Universal. You understand it's a little crowded and you can't move well, right? And if somebody, I hope this never happens, was shooting at you in those moments, it'd be easy for them to get some shots off and do some damage because you're all packed in there like sardines, right? So we understand that problem, the problem. But again, it's only a problem because Burnside refused to send people across the creek and wanted everybody to go across the bridge for no good reason. There, there's literally no good reason that we have from Burnside for even doing this. In fact, if you go there, this plaque at least was there when I was there, and I love this. One of the soldiers on Lee's army was a uh, Sharpsburg resident, and he makes the point, basically, that you could have just walked across without getting your belt wet, and to call it Burnside's Bridge is basically sarcasm. <laughs> and it is sarcasm. It's a complete debacle on Burnside's part from a sense of his uh, tactical awareness of what was going on. Okay. So how does it work out? Well, eventually he will cross the bridge, unsurprisingly. You've got more people than they do. And even going across the bridge and they're able to shoot, their 500 are able to do more damage on you in that very tight, constrained space. They're eventually able to get across and develop. Whereupon Burnside stops for two hours. So you're in the middle of a battle. Now he doesn't necessarily know what's happening to his north, but you spent all this time crossing the, the bridge to attack from the south. Stopping and waiting on anything is worthless. And so by doing so, he allowed for the final troops that Lincoln was waiting, I mean that Lee was waiting on, A.P. Hill, to show up, kind of marching up from Harper's Ferry with his 3,000 troops. His 3,000 troops plus the 3,000 that were already there, still two to one odds, Lee's able to move some more troops down here to this angle and it sort of changes the equation. Still you could have attacked, you could have had success at two to one odds, but Burnside feels like it's not useful and breaks off the attack after A.P. Hill's forces arrive and the Battle of Antietam comes to end, inconclusively. The Battle of Antietam is technically a draw um, for the Confederacy or for Confederacy historians. This is either number one or two on Lee's list of his best battles. For me, it's his best battle. Chancellorsville often is held up though as the other one that is his best battle. Um, for me, this one to me is, is, is more uh, impressive what he's able to do in the face of it. Although, again, arguably he's aided by the fact that he is facing um, um, McClellan in Burnside. It is our deadliest day in national history. Um, some 22,000 casualties. Again, we see casualties in warfare. It is talking killed, wounded, and that whole time. You can see the Confederacy lost more people. The real tragedy is this. He had over 20,000 troops in reserve that he never committed to the battle. This is what has Lincoln the most frustrated. And for Lincoln, this is kind of the end of his support of McClellan. He had gotten fed up with McClellan previously, but he didn't feel like he had another option. So for Lincoln, this is really the end result. Lincoln actually will go, this is him talking to McClellan at Antietam, begging McClellan to follow Lee. He doesn't. Lee's allowed to just head south. Uh, General Meade will get criticism after Gettysburg for also not following south. 
But in that battle, Meade committed all of our troops. It was a three-day slugfest. He really had no fresh troops. He maybe should have, but I always can give Meade a pass. There is no explanation or apology or a way to give McClellan a pass for this debacle. There are some outcomes, and we're going to move to the most important one now for the last part of the talk. And then hopefully there will be time for questions. I've always got questions for you guys. Answer questions if I can. The fact that they were able to stop um, Lee does lead to the raising of new troops in the Ohio, Pennsylvania area. This is a hint for what we're going to see. Lincoln is already finding trouble in getting support. Lee found the same thing in Maryland. When he marched into Maryland, he had his band playing pro-Maryland songs and he wanted to get people excited to come join the war. And most Marylanders closed their shutters and closed their doors and pulled in. Lee was like, what's going on? Well, what's happened is between the Battle of Bull Run, the Battle of Shiloh, and the smaller events that had occurred, the Seven Days Battle, what was becoming clear to people was that this was a war at a level of intensity with casualties and technology that they had not expected. Most people will tell you that World War I is the first kind of industrial war and that they surprised the Europeans and their tactics did not keep up with the industry and the technology. And I say that's true. And the only real problem with that is that had they looked at the United States Civil War, they would have known. Because almost all the major technological advantages that occur in 1914-19, we did first in 85. The Crimea War in the 1850s also gives that hint um, over between the Russians and the, the Ottoman Turks and the French and the British over in the Crimea experience, but ours is more expansive. It's right there, you can see it. So they weren't really clear as that handle it. And so by as early as 62, you have really lost all enthusiasm for joining the war. And Maryland will not join in, they will not secede, there'll be no leaders who rise up, and very few Maryland, there'll be some, but very few Marylanders will join in, go, or participate, anything like that. Meanwhile, he will fire McClellan. And when he fires McClellan, he, he's gonna to have to find somebody else to lead. He'll actually turn to Burnside, which kind of shocking there. We'll leave that alone for now. McClellan will be so angry that he will allow himself to become um, the presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. And he'll run against Lincoln in 64, which is again a whole other conversation in the process. But the big outcome is this. Lincoln makes plans to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. So let's turn our attention to that right there. And again, if you have questions about the battle specifically, please note them and write them down and we'll kind of, but I definitely want to make sure we get to this. So for this, we need to back up a little bit. Lincoln is a very complicated person, as most of us humans are. Certainly I am this way. Um, it is clear, my position is this, is that Lincoln personally did not like slavery. It should be noted that he married a Kentucky woman from a slaveholding family. And had he chosen to, he could have, as many people did, move in with his richer in-laws and made his whole life there in Kentucky as still a lawyer in the slaveholding South, participating in the wealth of his wealthy family, even if he and his wife never owned slaves, kind of connected to the slave you know, experience of her family. He chose not to. And by all accounts, Mary never asked him to. So they moved north. So that's to his credit. However, it is very clear that Lincoln was in no way, shape, form, or fashion an abolitionist. I probably should have put some slides in here about the abolition movement in general, but just let me say, what's incorrect to think is that the Civil War is fought between a slave-hating North and a slave-loving South. That's incorrect on multiple levels. I'll just point this one out. That even at the 56 election, when the Republicans run their first candidate, that's Fremont, who you see up here on the slides, um, and they're running as abolitionists, um, they, their support is, is, is low. Now, they'll get more support in the 56 election because the Whig Party, which was party number two, had basically begun to fall apart at this point, largely because Southern Whigs no longer were willing to vote for their party and began voting for their region. And so that's kind of the thought process that went down there. The North in general was not somehow an abolitionist stronghold. You have great African-American and white people like, like William Still in Philadelphia and Reverend John Rankin in Ripley, Ohio, and the Beecher family in Cincinnati, and William Lloyd Garrison and, and Douglas Freeman, 
but they are never more than 15% of the Northern population in support. And if you think, well, wait, Carl, they win the 1860 election, they should have had support at that point. In the 1860 election, moderate Whigs like Lincoln have seen the only path forward politically for them is to join into this party, which had come in second place in the 56 election and join in. I feel like for me, Lincoln puts his cards on the table when he makes his inaugural address. And you may remember his first inaugural address. He says clearly to the Southern South, which the war has not started at this point. Remember Fort Sumter's after his inaugural address. He's like, look, war's on your hands. I have no plans to assail you, meaning we are not going to march troops to, to and for what reason? To end slavery. We're not coming to do that. I have no plans for that. Fremont, who was in Missouri when the battle started, when the war started, really early on, as you can see there in August of 61, announces a general emancipation for his region. And as you can see, Lincoln rescinds it. Fremont remonstrates, and much like we get with Douglas MacArthur and Truman in the Korean War, Lincoln fires him. He's like, you can't be a general anymore. This guy was one of the most famous people in the country, maybe not the same level as Douglas MacArthur in the early 50s, but he was up there. And he had been a presidential candidate. He had had the success of being a pathfinder and had really participated in the Mexican War. And Lincoln's like, yep, we're not going down that road. Now, that's not to say Lincoln's like, I want to champion slavery, but he's just saying, we cannot make this about slavery. I'm sorry. We're not going to go down that road because what had he just done? He had kept Maryland, Kentucky, um, Missouri, and my mind's with totally blank, um, and Delaware out of the war, all four slaveholding states, and he kept them from joining the Confederacy. And so he doesn't want to risk that. Well, as you can see, a year later, roughly, um, David Hunter, who's a general down on the coast, because the Union Army basically in the Navy had gained control of the coastline to some degree, not in force, he issued an emancipation for all three states. Once again, Lincoln rescinds it. So Lincoln's position is really, really complicated. However, by the time of the debacle of the Seven Days War, he's having some second thoughts on the matter. He's not sure what's the right thing to do. Lincoln is an example of what the challenge was for the abolition movement, which is what will we do with these slaves when it's all over? And so Lincoln's position was with the majority viewpoint within the moderate side of the abolition movement, so not the main abolitionist. The main abolitionist view was we make these people citizens and we live out our creed and we expand what it means to be a pluralistic society. You have to understand at this point, we've had four score and seven years, uh, or at that point four score and six years, of living out a pluralistic society that was European based only, which for you and me can feel like, oh, yes, a bunch of white people. But don't tell an Irishman he's the equivalent of an Italian. And don't tell a Sicilian he's an Italian. And don't tell either one of them that they're German. So even though we may look at people of a certain ethnicity or color and just block them into a large scale group, most of you are very well aware that those ethnicity divisions and, and you know, the beauty of the, of, the, of the kind of kaleidoscope of who we are as a human species means that there's differences amongst all those groups. But the founders had never really considered multiculturalism or multipluralism to be beyond a European thing. This actually has come out post-Mexican War because suddenly we have a whole bunch of Hispanic people, mostly of Mexican, but other Hispanic people who are in our midst, what are we doing with those people? Congress doesn't settle that, and of course they don't have time to because the war comes, so the focus is on the war. So the general principle, and Lincoln's happy to say this is my view, is we will buy land for them in Africa. Clearly they want to go back to Africa, which is, Certainly misleading, if not discriminatory and derogatory to the people who had lived here, because by that point, everybody who was here who was a slave was born here. There still were a few people who had illegally been, been bought in slavery in Africa and brought over. There still were some ships, but legally, external trade had been outlawed since the early 1800s, and by and large, the South was fine with that. So everybody here in 1861-62 had been born here. And that generally is the position of most of the African-American leaders. He's like, look, I freaking built the South. Why do I have to leave? 
So they were happy to want to stay here. And, and it is important to note the influence of Frederick Douglass at this point. Frederick Douglass is the first African-American, certainly former slave, to be greeted and met in the White House by the president. And if you know anything about Mr. Douglass, you understand he's a brilliant man, he's extraordinarily erudite, he's well-spoken, and that clearly came across to Lincoln. So that by the time you're in this moment of deciding, well, what should we do about the war, Lincoln's position is beginning to change. You have to remember most people in the North had never seen a slave and in many cases never seen a black person. So their interactions with people of the South, of the slave, of the free group, of the, was very, very limited. It's not to give them a pass, but it is to say they were working to some degree out of an ignorance that upon meeting these men and women, they began to realize, oh, oh yeah, these people are just as smart, as intelligent, if not smarter than I am. And so this is when Lincoln's like, I probably need to come up with some other plan. This letter between him and Horace Greeley, though, again, provides us this evidence of saying, even in August, so I'm going to go forward and come back, because I went back and forth in my own mind where to put these slides like this, because prior to the war, Lincoln is beginning to think about emancipation. I'll come back to this in a minute. So this is in July when he tells his cabinet, I think I might try to have an emancipation, right? Well, the next month in August, he gets this letter from Greeley saying, you need to make this about the war. Greeley is an abolitionist. He'd been involved from the very beginning in the abolition movement. And Lincoln's like, no, no, I will not. And he said, my job is to fight for the Union. And, it, and you can see how he expresses himself. So this is after he's thinking about the emancipation. All right, does that make sense for everybody? Again, Lincoln, for some of you, if he's your hero, I may make it complicated for you. So, a paramount object is the Union, period. So. He then decides, he's, again, he's, he's thinking, this is, Lincoln is not an abolitionist, but he is a preeminent politician. And he is extraordinarily savvy. And he's thinking, how can I pull this off? How do I win this war? And like we just said a minute ago, he himself is aware that support for the war has dwindled. So now he's thinking, how can I turn this around? Well, who would be the most likely group of people to sign up to fight in the war, which I need, but the abolition community. And if I'm really brave and I let African Americans, these freedmen and freed slaves, also fight, wow. So that's his thinking. How can I can deal with this? He's very worried about the war expanding. He'd already had one brush with Europeans, the Great Britain, there's a moment when we capture a, a Confederate Navy ship, and on it was the ambassador or an ambassador from England to, to the Confederacy, um, from Great Britain. And then Lincoln lets him go. He's like, let these people go. Because obviously Great Britain remonstrated and said, wait a minute, you can't capture our guy talking to these people. And Lincoln's aware that the last thing he needs is, is either of the major European powers getting involved and certainly does not need to fight a two-front war. So that's his process here. Once the battle's over, even though you and I know militarily it's a draw, Lincoln is correctly able to say, we won because they retreated. We won, we have the ground, they left. And so he calls it out as a victory, and then on September 22nd, he gives the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, what does it do? Because this is the most complicated and to some degree, um, it's received very negatively in the North, let's just put it that way. And that's after a man who suspended habeas corpus mm -hmm. as president. What does it do? Well, you can see here, you know, that any person held as a slave with any, any state or part of the state in rebellion is forever free. And the military will maintain and recognize the freedom. And if they are suitable condition, meaning you can walk and talk, you can be in the armed services. Well, that sounds great. That sounds like he deserves the title, Lincoln, the Great Emancipator. Unfortunately, I see what it doesn't do, because this is the part that's the trickiest. What I do with my students, and if I had time, I would have made you do it, which is read it, and then tell me, what does it do? So what does it say? It's saying, it's calling out play people in states of rebellion. This is a, cru a crucial phrase. We'll come back to this in a second. What does it not do? 
Well, it technically frees no slaves whatsoever. Because what is this at this moment in time? It's another nation. If President Biden decided he would make a law for Canada or Mexico, we know the citizens in those nations would say, you can't make that law. You're not in charge of us. This is obviously raising the point of how do we perceive these nations. So Lincoln's position is there is no such nation. They don't exist. They're just states in rebellion. Fair enough. But I'm a realist. If you were here last month, you heard our professor talking about the difference between different schools of political thought. And on the ground, you have another nation that is engaged in all the actions of other nations, including trade and diplomatic worldwide activity and these kinds of things. So look at what it doesn't do. It not only doesn't free the slaves in every part of the South, it says only those states in rebellion. So Tennessee is one of the states in rebellion. No slaves are freed there. Anywhere the Union Army is, and it specifically mentions lower Louisiana, western and coastal Virginia. So coastal Virginia here, coastal North Carolina, and in the western part of Virginia, which this map cheats and shows you is West Virginia. But if you're a Virginian, you know right now that's not true at this point in the story, right? Down here where New Orleans is, no slaves are freed. In Missouri, Kentucky, West well, Maryland, Delaware, no slaves are freed. What does that mean? Where Lincoln actually is the president, he frees no slaves at all. Where he's not the president, he says, yeah, y'all can go free. Meaning it has no good whatsoever because those people would say, you're not my president. Does that make sense for you? See what I'm trying to point out to you? I'm trying to show the complexity here. Now, is Lincoln an idiot? Not at all. Is, did he just miss something? Did he, did he pull Woodrow Wilson and start drawing lines on a map that he didn't know anything about? No. He's being very intentional about what he's saying and where he's trying to do something. What he's being very intentional about doing is he knows he is freeing not a single slave at all. So he cannot be doing this for the act of becoming the great emancipator. Well, what are we left with? Well, this kind of raises, first of all, the question of what's gone on. Now, Lincoln, again, makes his argument, as I already told you, that, oh, there are states in rebellion. I'm still their president, even though none of them voted for him in the process. Right? And I'm still their president. However, he had already shown his own actions about this very thing. As you may know, and as we alluded to just a second ago, in the western part of Virginia, when Virginia voted the second time to secede, Leaders in the western, more mountainous parts of Virginia, where there was very little slavery at all, said, we don't want to participate in this. Lincoln's able to move forces in immediately. Do you remember how I told you Lee was fighting in these western counties and did a poor job of it, and so he got sidelined? This is the moment. The Confederacy also moved troops in from Virginia to try to combat. McClellan's there, actually, and has some showdown. He, he does better in West Virginia than he does anywhere else, and Lee does worse. Lincoln did remove these people in and accept them within the next year as a state. Meaning what? Meaning he accepted that Western Virginia seceded from Virginia. His arguments that secession didn't happen clearly fall apart just upon looking at the Virginia. Now, where does that leave us? Well, what's he doing? If we're not freeing any slaves, first and foremost, he is, he's dealing with Great Britain. Great Britain had already outlawed slavery. France had followed suit after the Napoleonic Wars, mostly by force from Great Britain. He knows that if he makes the war about slavery, and by declaring it, go back to this real quick, by this part here, that the military forces will maintain the freedom of said persons, he knows he's making this a military activity, a military reality that slaves will come to the army wherever the army is. So then what is the movement of the forces about? It's not necessarily to go get slaves free, but where they go, slaves will think they can become free. Meaning the fighting on the battlefield will be about slavery. Meaning if I make it about slavery, are you an abolitionist? Nah, 
Do you care? Well, I don't want anybody to be a slave, but I don't really care necessarily. I just told Greeley I didn't care. But I tell you what, I certainly do not want Great Britain getting involved or France. So if I make it about slavery, there's no way in hell that Britain or France will get involved in this. Brilliant. It is the most brilliant, tactical, diplomatic, savvy move any president's ever made in national history. Britain backs off. They still help out with the Confederate Navy a little bit, but even that dries up a little bit. What else does it do? He knows it will hurt the Southern economy. Word will get through the South, albeit slowly, and if you know the story of our wonderful Juneteenth celebration, it's not till 65 that it gets all the way to the West. But he knows word will filter through the South. As it filters through the South, the African-American slave community will realize if we can just get to the army, we can be free. Some will not have an army nearby and they will walk off. I don't mean to offend anybody who's a Lincoln supporter, but if it were me, I'd take Lincoln off his little chair in DC and I'd put an African-American slave family right there in that same chair. Because what the Emancipation Proclamation does for those people is support their brave actions that they've been doing for the decades they've been here in pursuing freedom. And sometimes they went where an army could protect them, and many times they didn't. They just said, now's our chance. We're going to leave. And we think we can find support to defend us in the process. And it will harm the, account, harm the economy. Thirdly, as I already noted, it will raise support. And he was right. Amongst the abolitionist community, both white and African American, if you've seen the movie Glory, they do a good job of showing this in a microcosm, dealing with the 54th, but they do a good job of that idea of the enthusiasm that begins to come. And it will work out. And then thirdly, and fourthly I should say, amongst the real Republicans, don't go with what they call them, and if you ever study Reconstruction of radical Republicans, that's a statement that's really too long for me to break down right now, but basically that's a derisive statement about the fact that the Republican Party was an abolitionist party. So I call them the real Republicans, meaning Lincoln's not one of them. Lincoln's a moderate. The real Republicans wanted abolition, and they fought for it tooth and nail and have been fighting for 30 years to get there politically and also ground action. And Lincoln's emancipation will give cover and if you saw the movie Lincoln that was based off of Kearns, this very good book about him that came out uh, probably now 10 years ago, right? Something like that. But if you see that movie, they do show a good job of Lincoln behind the scenes trying to put pressure. And I think that's fair. If Lincoln ever becomes an abolitionist, I think it is after this moment. His interactions with Freeman and others really begins to raise in his mind that I was wrong in my viewpoint of these, these people and they are my equal. And I think he begins to make that shift. So he is very supportive. And eventually, as you know, the, 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 slave, the slaves will become free, not through the emancipation, but through the 13th Amendment. And he'll get that passed. In the, they'll get that passed, as you can see, in January of 65. It's a mixed reaction. We're almost done. It's a very mixed reaction. It's really the most um, complicated or, or um, of all the things he does, it's deeply opposed. He'll have entire units um, of northern soldiers walk off the, the battlefield. They're like, I will fight for Union. I won't fight for some other reason. And they will leave and they'll walk off. Um, he'll have to deal with the potential. There had already been conversations in Indiana and Illinois of potentially a secession movement to secede and join Canada. It was a very small group of people, but still there were some elected officials. He will again suspend habeas corpus and arrest some of those leaders as well and put them in jail for a prolonged period of time, and then he'll have some of them he'll send to the South, and some will go up to Canada to leave. He's like, you wanna go with those people? Go right ahead. New England is very enthusiastic, because that was always really the heartbeat. Cincinnati, where you may know today, is uh, where our National Museum is for the Underground Railroad. I highly recommend it to you. If you ever go, make sure you drive 20 miles down the river to Ripley, Ohio, which, as the uh, Southerners called it, was the hell hole of abolition. And I'm going to actually do a talk about Ripley, Ohio, and Reverend John Rankin and John P. Parker and some other great um, abolitionists who fought during the Underground Railroad because I think Ripley's such a fun story. Mm -hmm. Next year I'll do that. African Americans will join in and be very supportive. By the end of the war, almost 200,000 men will participate and do very well. Again, the movie Glory is just one example of that. Over one third will die in battle. Um, their treatment with by um, uh, Confederate forces will be uh, heinous. And so there's a higher level of death and woundedness for the African troops than uh, the white troops from the North. But they will be crucial in the battle. 
And um, as the Union forces make their way through the South, they will be greeted by thousands, and in some cases, tens of thousands of African Americans who join them, making their way wherever they go. Sherman in particular, when he makes his march from Atlanta, or really from Chattanooga down to Savannah, but he will pick up uh, over 100,000 African Americans who are walking with him for their protection in the process. It doesn't mean the war is going to be over, much like the Midway Battle of 1942 or Stalingrad in 42, even though the war uh, has shifted and there's no way for Germany or Japan to win after that moment. Um, there's still going to be battles to be fought. And so, as you are probably very well aware, 1863 is really the year of warfare. The biggest battles on ground and the number of big battles all occur in 1863. Um, but and it won't go well up in 62, but eventually we'll get there. And this kind of brings us to our conclusion. This kind of recaps really kind of what I've already already said to you. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation, I think is very telling because of how savvy Lincoln is and what he does. I think it's important for us to hold it in esteem. It does provide cover for those Republican Congress people who want a 13th Amendment and they're able to push forward with it. It does provide crucial impetus to many African Americans who were looking for and already trying to get away, but still many had just stayed on their farms. There are many accounts of slave, whole slave communities on plantations, basically having no white person around them at this point, but having not fled or left, largely because they weren't sure maybe where they could go safely. And so now the Emancipation Proclamation provides that kind of cover. It, it isn't crucial for the winning of the war, but it does, as Lincoln will say, when he gives the Gettysburg Address, kind of provide the country a new birth of freedom and a new focus. And it will raise all the questions that will be addressed and challenged and answered, and answered, I think, poorly out of Reconstruction. It doesn't somehow solve our questions, our issues relative to how we do uh, a multicultural society. But it opened that door that that's where we want to go. That's where most of us want to go, as imperfectly as we will get there, and can we try to get there in that, in that reaction. I think Lincoln gets, deserves credit for being willing to give it. It's just important for us to connect it to his vision politically and diplomatically, as well as to what uh, had happened on the battlefield of Antietam. So I'll stop right there and see if you have any questions you want to ask. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I was just curious as to what extent the cotton trade uh, influenced uh, British foreign policy towards the South. It was huge because up to the breaking of the war, had, had the Confederacy existed in 1855, it would have been the third or fourth most richest country in the world. And so England initially, Britain, is, is forced to think about how do we continue to feed our industrial strength, which the industrial, earlier industrial revolution is fed on the steam engine and on textiles, the making of clothing. They eventually would figure out that, you know what? We actually can get cotton in Egypt. And so uh, we can go there. The South will not economically recover for a very long time, arguably not to the 1980s with the coming of the Sun Belt uh, phenomenon when the Northern industries moved South. Um, does the South really ever recover economically to its position that it was in in 1850? Thank you. You're welcome.